We are going to be winding up uh, our series on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm already, my mind's already kind of gravitating towards our next topic, which is going to be pretty interesting. It's new content. It's new content. It's, it's going to be, it'll be probably challenging, but uh, I'm kind of excited about it. So, and we're going to be kind of laying the groundwork for that by winding up this series. We'll probably button it up today. We might go one more week. I'll just see how, uh, how this sermon goes. But we've been doing a flyby over the Sermon on the Mount. We've been touching on the topics. We haven't been digging deep into uh, the layers and the nuance that exists within the text. But sometimes that's a good thing. You know, sometimes if we can see the big picture, it helps us to understand excuse me, the details a little bit better. And so here we are, <coughs> excuse me, that humidity, it's killing me. It's blessing and a curse, right? <coughs> and so here we are with Jesus giving us the Sermon on the Mount with the Lord's Prayer. Most of us can recite the Lord's Prayer, right? Not that it was necessarily intended to be something that you recite. Are you aware of that? The, the prayer is Jesus demonstrating how to have a relationship with God. And he's hitting on the topics we need to have in mind when we come into a relationship with God. So prayer isn't about reciting words. It's about engaging in a relationship with a person. And in this case, we're talking about God. And so Jesus is demonstrating the type of things he wants us to have in mind when we're engaging in a healthy relationship with God. And so memorizing the prayer is good because it's, it's like a template where you can think about the type of frame of mind and heart I need to have whenever I come before a good and holy God. And so the very first words Jesus tells us to utter when we're addressing God is he tells us whenever we come before our Father in heaven, we're to pray like this. Now, have you heard this? Have you heard how radical the idea that Jesus is introducing to us whenever he uses the word Father, the original Greek word? You'll see it in commentaries all the time. It's better translated Daddy. Have you heard this before? Now listen, that always bugs me when I read that because I'm a grown man. I don't refer to my father as daddy, right? He's my dad. I stopped using the word daddy when I was like three years old. And so that always kind of bugs me to read that. But the, the idea is, and it's a radical idea that Jesus is introducing. No one had ever thought of God like this before, before Jesus introduced this idea. God is like your dad. And so this is the very first thing Jesus wants us to have in mind when we're approaching God is that his posture towards us is like a dad. And so he's excited to see you. He has your best interest at heart. And so whenever Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount and he's giving us the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. That word blessed means happy. And so Jesus is telling us God's posture towards us is like a dad. And whenever parents talk about their kids, you know, and they talk about what they want their kids to become, you'll almost hear everyone say, I just want my kids to be happy. Right? I don't care what my kid does when they, when they grow up. I just want my kids to be happy. And so this is a major topic in the Sermon on the Mount, is happiness. How many of you are happy, consider yourself to be a happy person? That's good. You know, I think about that word, and I, 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 I think I have a complicated relationship with that word. Uh, you know, I think about... <clears throat> 
things that I take pleasure in in life. When you think about being happy, you think about things that bring you pleasure. You know, Jesus is hitting on some of the highlights of the things in life that bring us pleasure, and then we, when we don't do them appropriately, it just brings great dysfunction into our life. And so Jesus is talking to us about things like, uh, don't act like a jerk. I'm going to summarize the Sermon on the Mount for you. Don't act like a jerk, okay? Be loyal to your wife. Learn how to express love to people who disgust you. I mean, at the end of the day, this is what Jesus is talking about. If you don't learn how to do these things, it's going to inject great brokenness and dysfunction into your life, and you will be incapable of being a happy person. Okay, let me repeat that list for you. Don't act like a jerk. Be loyal to your spouse. Learn how to express love to people who disgust you. That is a discipline, that is a skill that the body of Christ is to develop. Here's another one. Don't be fake. Don't do things just to gain a good reputation from other people. I've just summarized Matthew chapters 5 and 6 for you. God is a father who wants his kids to be happy. If you don't learn to do these things, you will be incapable of sustained happiness. I have a complicated relationship with that word. Uh, you know, on the one hand, I am very happily married. I'm very satisfied with my marriage. I love my job. You know, I feel lucky to get to do this. Uh, I, get to, I get to contemplate the things of God and then share what I find with other people. And there's nothing I love more to, there's nothing I love more than to get to do that. You know, the, one of the things in the Sermon on the Mount is blessed are those, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. And ultimately, you know, I think people a lot of times find pleasure in life, but real happiness can only be achieved as a consequence of getting to see and behold God for who he is. You can find pleasure in life without that, but real happiness can only be derived as a consequence of being awakened in our spirit and being able to see God for who he is. And so God wants us to see him and derive pleasure from getting to develop a relationship with him. And he wants us to understand first and foremost, he's a dad. And so he's a dad who likes his kids and is excited to get to see them. He takes pleasure in you. That's true of everyone. You know? So when we come before God, he wants us to understand he takes pleasure in our presence. And he wants us to take pleasure in his presence. You know, I want my kids to like me. Right? A lot of people will say, well, you're not supposed to be friends with your kids. You're supposed to be their dad. Well, why can't I have both? Right? Why can't I be both? Ultimately, that's what we're going for. Uh, God is inviting us into his presence, not so he can scold us, not so he can discipline us, not so he can call us out for our sin. It's because he enjoys our company. And so when Jesus is praying, we pray to God first of all, we recognize him as dad, our father who art in heaven, dad who is in heaven. He lives in a different space and his name is holy, okay? And so here's, a, here's the juxtaposition. And a lot of times when we talk about this, we're talking about how serious God is. God's holy, you know. And that's true. But I think there's a more important angle to this uh, that Jesus is trying to tell us. 
Because many times whenever we, whenever I've taught on this in other churches, there's always somebody who says, yeah, you talk about God as dad, but the problem is that doesn't paint a very good picture for me because I didn't have a very good dad. I hear this all the time. And I understand that. And, and you know, I, I sympathize with that. I feel sorry for people who didn't have a dad at all or the dad that they had was a jerk uh, or abusive. And that... That picture for them paints a bad picture. What Jesus is trying to instruct us is we're addressing a dad who's completely unlike any earthly dad and his character is perfect. And so here's the point. You're addressing the dad that you always wanted deep in your heart. And that's even true for me. You know, I'm an earthly father. God is a heavenly father. I fall short and so my kids are going to develop, hopefully, they're going to develop to the place where they understand that there's limitations to what I can do to help them go out there in the world and be successful. They're going to need something else. And that's built into the equation because God wants my kids ultimately to detach from me, this is healthy, to detach from me so that they can attach to God. God is different. And so even if you had a crummy dad, everybody growing up in their mind has this image of what a perfect dad would be like, and I wish I had a dad like that. Well, guess what? You do. And so as much as I sympathize with people who had bad dads, if you get fixated on that, me feeling sorry for you doesn't help you any with that, right? That doesn't do anything to help somebody. And so the best thing I can tell somebody who grew up uh, with bad parents is to get over it. Stop fixating on that. And start fixating on what Jesus is instructing us here. To realize that God is a dad who's completely unlike any earthly dad. His character is perfect and he's the dad you've always wanted. So the sooner you get over feeling sorry for yourself... The sooner you can have that picture painted for you and your mind and heart can begin to become populated with the positive emotions, with the vision this God has for you, for your character, and for your life. And whenever that begins to, to populate your mind and heart, you can begin manifesting that behavior and be a blessing to the world around you. And everything about that influence is going to produce happiness. Our Father who art in heaven, your name is holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now this is profound. And this is going to be the groundwork for where we go with the next part of the series. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? God's plans are to produce a society of people who are able to produce or manifest heaven on the earth. I'm going to let that settle a little bit. And so the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus instructing his people how to manifest the behavior that will create heaven on earth. Now, one of the problems with the topic of heaven is that we've got so many fairy tales, I, fairy tale ideas about what it is. We don't really think about it at all, but we all long for it. And so this is why I have a complicated relationship with ha happiness, okay? As much as I love my family, and I do, I like my family as well. You know, people have to love their family, but I actually like my family as well. I do love my job. But there is this nagging and persistent frustration that keeps me from enjoying complete happiness. So temperamentally, I'm not really that happy most of the time. I have this nagging 
frustration with all of the things around me that are wrong, with all of the things that need to get fixed that keep me from truly relaxing, being at peace and at home, and enjoying my life. Most of the time, I get caught up with the problems around me. And Jesus tells us not to do that. I just have a hard time doing it. But that's, again, built into the equation because God wants there to be a yearning in our hearts for something more. And so that's why I don't believe people whenever they tell me, oh, I'm a happy person. Really? You're really happy. Because there is something way better than what we're experiencing here in this life right now. Are you getting this, church? So people who always tell me they're really happy, okay, there is something wrong with you. I'm jealous a little bit, but there ought to be a yearning in the body of Christ for something more. Church, there's got to be something more than this. And God wants us to begin yearning for that something more and expressing that in prayer to him because we want God's kingdom to come right here, right now, and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that hasn't happened yet, and that's why we pray for it. Are you with me? So church, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus teaching the body of Christ how to manifest the behavior that will create that environment here and now. We have a part to play, we have a role to play in training our minds and hearts in these attributes to the extent that we do it, we will manifest heavenly behavior and relationships and happiness right here and right now. Now, that should be exciting, you know? Our Father who art in heaven. And so it's important to memorize these words because it helps us to address God in healthy ways. The more healthy, the more healthy we address God and relate to God, the more his character, his attributes manifest in our minds and hearts. We express them to the world. We are creating heaven on the earth right now. Now, we won't fully have it until the return of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead, right? But we can have it in part, in substantial ways, right here and now. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, thank you. And this is just how I do it. When I, whenever I use this as a template to pray to God, I'm mindful. God, thank you. I know you enjoy me. I know you take pleasure in our relationship. I'm so grateful for that. Father, thank you that your character and your attributes are perfect. And the more I get in agreement with you, the better my life will get. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. God, I pray that you would transform the people of First Methodist Hobbs. I pray that they'd have a hunger and a thirst for the things of God. And that they would begin manifesting your character, your attributes, your words, your speech. Even the emotions with, with which you express things. Let them give expression to your emotions, Father, as they relate to the people around them. See, I'm praying that God's kingdom would manifest right here and right now. So I pray for the politicians in Hobbs and Lee County. Those are really important things to get right. God wants there to be justice in our community. He wants good decisions to be made so that people can prosper and be blessed in their life. So these are, these are specific things we pray that are in conjunction with what Jesus is teaching us. And so I always say, if you just memorize the Lord's Prayer and recite it, it's like buying a really expensive and fancy tool from Home Depot and just showing it to your friends every once in a while so they think you're cool. Okay? If you've got that tool, probably a good idea if you spend all that money and you actually use the tool to make something good, right? 
The Lord's Prayer is kind of like that. If you just recite it, you're just kind of showing off a fancy tool every now and then. But if you actually use it to assist you in developing a healthy relationship with God, now you're getting somewhere. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. I really pray all the time that God would transform the city that I live in, and I pray for the surrounding counties, and the reason I do that rather than get focused on the federal government is because I have specific authority right here where I live. And so as we approach a big, hairy election coming up here in the fall, and people want to get really focused on that, I encourage people to really get focused on Hobbs and Lee County and the surrounding counties. Because this is where we have specific authority as the body of Christ. I can make an impact on Hobbs and Lee County. Nobody will ever know my name in Washington, D.C. Do you understand, church? And so uh, I pray that God's kingdom would come, God's will would be done, where I have specific spiritual and personal authority and impact. And then Jesus says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so, I need to be mindful of my weakness and the traps that will cause me to manifest toxic behavior. Toxic behavior destroys me physically and it destroys my relationships. So I need to pray that the light of Jesus Christ would shine on my mind and heart and reveal where I am in agreement with satanic ideas. Now, there's some obvious ones, okay? Jesus teaches us on the Sermon on the Mount. There's some obvious satanic ideas, like I can have sex with whoever I want to, and as long as they agree to it, it's okay. That is a satanic idea. Manifesting behavior like that will ruin your life. You understand me, church? It doesn't matter if you're single or married. Manifesting behavior like that will ruin your life. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then there's lesser ideas, okay? I can eat whatever I want to and Jesus will forgive me, so it's okay. We all understand these are kind of obvious, these are kind of Captain Obvious things to say. But, it, 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 you know, that's how it goes. There are all kinds of places where you and I are in agreement with ideas and ways of thinking that are destroying our ability to be happy. And so I need to present my mind and heart to God so that he can shine light on those areas and lead me away from that way of thinking towards a way of thinking that's going to produce Happiness in my life. Because you know what? Your dad wants you to be happy. Your dad is committed to your happiness. Your dad is so committed to your happiness that he demonstrated that by becoming a human being, by suffering and dying on a cross. That is God demonstrating how much he loves you and how much he is committed to your happiness. Which is what heaven is going to produce. Heaven is going to produce a world where everyone is Deeply, deeply happy. Everyone. And that isn't true of anyone right now. I don't care how happy you think you are. That isn't true of anyone right now. And so God is demonstrating in the Sermon on the Mount the types of behaviors that we are to learn to become more and more sophisticated at so that we can produce, through our words, speech, and actions, a world where heaven is possible. And here's the thing we need to think about. I I'm going to set you up for the next sermon right now. <clears throat> what do you think heaven's going to be? You think Walt Disney is going to create heaven for us? What do you think heaven's going to be? How do you think it's going to be produced? 
Do you think God's just going to strike you with lightning and turn you into a perfect person? With the perfect thoughts? Manifesting the perfect behaviors? Or do you think you're going to have to learn that? You know, it's like people get the idea that they're going to be raised from the dead and everybody around them is just going to be amazing. Now, I'm still going to be the same person that I am, but I'm going to expect you to be amazing. We don't really think about these thoughts. And so when we think about church, and we've got this narrative that, well, I'm saved and I'm just waiting for heaven. That is utter nonsense. It's foolishness. The church is to be in strict training so that we can learn to manifest the behaviors that are going to create what God intends, which is heaven on earth. Have you ever thought about it that way? That completely changes what we're doing here, by the way. You understand? And it's kind of, it's difficult whenever you've got, it's such an important and weighty idea that you've got to say in like 25, 30 minutes, you know? This is profound. And so this is why the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' penultimate You know, maybe next to the message of the cross, the penultimate message of Scripture is the church being deeply committed to training in these attributes so that heaven will be possible whenever Jesus intends to make it manifest on the earth. How is it possible? How is it possible that this is going to be uh, a world transformed into this amazing place if people don't know how to act right. So, that we're, we're setting up for the next sermon, and there you go, that's the preview. I'm gonna, I'll stop right there. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that, you know, you just do a flyby on topics like this, but, the implications <laughs> the implications are profound and weighty and and have the power to change who we are so father we thank you that your words promise us a recipe for happiness Your words provide for us a life filled with people that we love. And these are really the raw ingredients for meaning and purpose and joy in life, happiness and love. And so, Father, thank you for for leading us away from satanic deceptions, the idea that happiness is found in, in pleasures, Father, we just pray that you would give us the power to become a church that understands how important this mission that you've given us is. It's described as the narrow road. It's difficult. It takes a lot of effort. But it leads to this amazing, glorious society where everyone is happy. And so, Father, we thank you that you have called us into this assignment, into this project. Holy Spirit, change our minds. Set us free from bondages that keep us chained to toxic behaviors. We are powerless to do it in our own, but we know that you are powerful and it is your joy and delight to set us free so that we can experience the life you want us to have. May your kingdom come and your will be done at First Methodist Hobbs, in the city of Hobbs, in Lee County. We pray that for every household represented here. I pray that for your home. May God's kingdom come, his will be done in your household as it is in heaven, in your speech, in the 
the effects, affection with which you speak to those closest to you, may God's kingdom be expressed, his affections be expressed towards those around you. May he give you power to know what to say, how to say it, when to say it. It's all, it's all God's grace and intent to create heaven on earth, starting in your mind and heart, manifesting in those closest to you, and then impacting the world around you. Father, we pray that we'd be a people who are in agreement with your plans and purposes. We pray and ask this as a body, in Jesus' name, amen.